My name is Kristen O'Hara. I'm Director of Interpretation at Paja Rito Environmental Education Center, or PEAK, as it's lovingly known, which is located in Los Alamos, uh, Los Alamos, New Mexico. And I'm going to be the moderator for tonight's talk. And tonight's talk, in case you're wondering, is called Ew to O. Tips for better birding photography. And we are being led by this evening by Jonathan Dowell and Bob Walker. So awesome. Thank you so much, you two, for joining us. A little bit before we get started. Peak, in case you don't know, operates the Los Alamos Nature Center in Los Alamos, New Mexico. And we are open from 10 to 4 every day except for Tuesdays and Sundays. So come on down and visit us. And if you want to learn more about what we're doing, please check out our website, which is peecnature.org, peecnature.org, to learn more about upcoming programs and events and just like so much stuff. We are, of course, able to offer programs like this this evening thanks to our generous support from our members and donors. So if you are a member, donor, or volunteer, thank you so much. We couldn't do it without you. If you're interested in volunteering or becoming a donor or member, please, again, check out our website, pecnature.org. Okay, so let's get started. A little bit about our presenters this evening. Jonathan Dowell, PhD, has been a birder for five decades. Woo. Arriving in Los Alamos in 1989 for work as a postdoc in engineering physics, he retired from the National Laboratory in 2018. Since then, he has been observed, he's observed 421 bird species, wow, and photographed 377 of them. Several of his 30,000 plus photographs are on display at the Chuperero Gallery near Bosque del Apache in, in San Antonio, New Mexico. And many other online, and many of his other photographs can be found online on Instagram. He is at Snowy Egret Photography. Bob Walker is an avid peak volunteer and former board member. If you ever are at the Nature Center on a Wednesday morning, go say hi to Bob. He's always in the observation room identifying birds and he will talk your ear off and it's fantastic. He also helps with lots of different programs including uh, leads a lot of bird walks for the Nature Center. He's a part of the Los Alamos Photography Club and Los Alamos Master Gardeners. Thank you, Jonathan Bob, for joining us this evening. I'm going to hand things over to Jonathan to share your screen and um, begin your talk. And I'll just be moderating the chat for questions. Thanks, everybody. Good evening, everybody, and thank you all for joining us. I think there are a number of friends and fellow birders signed in. Uh, so thanks and welcome. Tonight, uh, Bob Walker and I are going to share some of our successes with bird photography. Just like farmer's insurance, if we know a thing or two, it's because we've seen a thing or two. In the past two and a half years, and this updates what Kristen just told you because it's been two weeks since I wrote my bio, I've now seen 434 species and photographed 392 species. I've taken just over 30,000 pictures of birds. Bird photography can help you in at least five ways. It helps you pay attention to the little details helping you to be mindful of the wilderness. It also helps you to remember what you've seen, and it lets you share what you've seen with your friends. A big plus is your photography makes a record <laughs> so you can figure out later what it was you saw. I use that feature all the time. Your photographs will increase awareness of all this beauty. Making yourself and your friends aware of the beauty may help this generation preserve this wilderness before it is gone. So tonight I'm going to share some of the simple techniques that I use to make great bird photos. I'm gonna share a little bit about how to find the birds, then how to use the camera, and finally the recipe that I use to edit my photos. Now, tip number one is obvious. You have to find the birds before you can take their pictures. Many birds are most active early in the morning, so if you can, you should get up and be on station at sunrise. The light during the golden hour after sunrise will make your pictures better too. Birds tend to congregate 
in locations called hotspots. In Los Alamos, these hotspots include the Nature Center, Ashley Pond, the streams in our canyons, and believe it or not, the top hotspot is the sewage plant down in White Rock, where 160 different species have been recorded. New Mexico is also home to nine different national wildlife refuges. These refuges protect great wilderness for finding birds, including the fabulous Bosque del Apache that is one of the best birding sites on the entire planet. Now Cornell University maintains a worldwide database of bird sightings on their eBird.org. You can use their Explore Regions tool on that website to find the top birding hotspots in every country, every state, and every county worldwide. Tip number two, use a spotter. Marry one if you have to. When I'm squinting through a telephoto lens waiting for a bluebird to turn its head and smile, I can lose track of all the other birds around me. There's no way that I would notice if an elegant trogon flew in and perched on a branch six feet behind me unless Tessa was there to tell me about it. I wouldn't see half of the birds that I see if it weren't for my wife Tessa's excellent skills at birding. Now, on to using the camera. By far, the most important feature of a great bird photo is sharp focus. I use autofocus. My camera lets me set a single pinpoint spot for focusing, and I aim that spot right at the bird. Especially with a telephoto lens, it is hard to hold the camera steady. So whenever possible, I brace the camera with a tripod or against a rock or against a tree. To help steady the camera as I shoot, I see the bird in the viewfinder, then squeeze the shutter trigger. And then I make sure the view is still the same after the shutter has taken the picture. The view screen on the back of a digital camera is a trap. Don't be in such a hurry to look at it to review your photo that you move the camera before it is finished taking the picture. Exposure is determined by three things, the shutter speed, the size of the lens aperture, and the speed of the film. Of these three, by far the shutter speed is the most important. Especially with a telephoto lens, do whatever you have to do to get a fast shutter speed. Fast shutter speed will freeze the motion of the flitting bird and the motion of you wiggling the camera. So use a wide aperture and fast ISO. Don't be afraid to use high SO in your digital camera. High ISO isn't as grainy as it was in the old days of film. As an example, I saw this American bittern one morning at 7 a.m. at the bottom of a ditch before the sun was reaching down there. So I used ISO 3200 to get a fast shutter speed to get this great shot. Another trick that I used is to set exposure compensation to underexpose by about two thirds of a stop just to make the shutter speed that much faster. You'll want to experiment if you use underexposure as different cameras and different lenses will have different tolerances for underexposure. The biggest exception is when the bird is up against the sky, either when it is flying or perched in a tree. In those cases, I set the exposure compensation to around plus two thirds of a stop just to keep the camera's auto exposure from getting fooled by the bright sky. Whenever possible, get the sun behind you so that you're not looking and shooting into the sun. For instance, when you arrive at Ashley Pond at dawn to photograph the ducks, park on the east side so that you're walking away from the sun as you approach the pond. If you can, Get the wind behind you too. That'll make it easier to photograph birds flying towards you because they slow down when they're flying into the wind. There are several things you can do to camouflage yourself to get closer to the birds. 
If you don't have a photo blind, you can make one out of a big cardboard box. You want to hide your silhouette so have a wall or tree behind you so your silhouette isn't stark against the sky. When I used bird blinds in Texas, I really loved that they had both a, a wall in the front with a window cut in it and a wall behind with no window so that when I stood in the blind, the back wall blocked my silhouette, hiding me from the birds even better. Move slowly and speak softly. Try to act like a cow in a pasture as birds seem to ignore them. Sometimes if you have to walk toward a bird, if you zigzag, instead of walking straight towards the bird, you won't scare it away. That's how I got to within 40 yards of this Swainson's hawk, took this picture, then turned and walked away from the hawk with it just sitting there calmly watching me. And in case your bird flies away, before you are as close as you hope to get, take another picture after every few steps during your zigzag approach. Get good gear. The old adage of you get what you pay for is true. And a hobby is something that costs you money, but you don't mind. Although there are some good compact cameras out there, the digital SLRs still give better results. I chose my Canon 7D because of its tiny pixel size of only four microns, just to get as many pixels as I can on that tiny bird in the viewfinder. I use image stabilizing lenses, which helps reduce blur from shaking the camera. Although I have a 600 millimeter prime lens, my smaller 400 millimeter telephoto is adequate for many shots and is much easier to carry and aim. But in a pinch, you can get some amazing shots just by holding your cell phone up to the eyepiece of your spotting scope or binoculars. That's how I got this photo of this baby peregrine falcon in its nest at Bosque del Apache. The last step is post-production processing. There's a lot to explain here, but let me try to make this quick. I have no qualms about editing bird photographs. A camera is not intended for making scientific measurements. A camera is merely a tool to help you get pictures. So I think it is totally fair to edit the pictures to make them look like the scene the way you saw it, rather than how your camera recorded it. I use Photoshop to edit my photos. On this slide, I'm showing you the same photo of a red knot on the beach before and after editing. I use the same recipe for editing all my photos. First, I brighten the levels. On this slide, the chart at the bottom shows a histogram of the brightness of all the pixels. These brightnesses are called the levels. Across the bottom of each chart is a scale of brightness from completely black to completely white. In this picture, the original picture on the left, see how all the pixels are bunched up together in this blob in the middle of the chart, indicating all the, the pixels are about the same shade of gray. Above the chart in the original picture, see how it is all murky gray. So in the levels tool in the Photoshop <coughs> chart, excuse me, the first thing I do <coughs> is move the slider on the left to the left shoulder of this blob. <clears throat> instructing the computer to take that level of gray and make it completely black. Then I adjust the slider on the right to the right shoulder of the blob, instructing the computer to take that level of gray and make it completely white. Then when I click OK, the computer stretches the histogram so that the pixels go all the way now from black to white. The chart on the right shows the resulting histogram. The pixels are now spread out not bunched up in all similar shades of gray. In the final the picture above, notice how the picture is brighter, the colors are more vivid, and the details are more pronounced. This single stretch, single step of stretching the levels does most of the work in transforming the picture from ew to ooh. After adjusting the levels, next I use two different sharpness filters. The high pass sharpening filter works so well to remove blur, it is almost like science fiction. 
there are good videos on YouTube about how to use the high pass filter in Photoshop. I re recommend that you watch one of those tutorials. After sharpening, next I boost the color saturation. This makes the reds redder and the blues bluer. Finally, I boost the contrast, which enhances the details, usually smooths the image, and frequently lifts the bird out from the background. Although this recipe is for Photoshop, other photo editing software will do similar things. There are a few free photo editing programs too. Of those free editors, I like the one that is included in your Instagram membership the best. You use it when you post a picture on Instagram. Now this slide shows the same recipe ed editing step by step. From the original picture, first I adjust the levels, then the sharpness, then the color saturation, and finally the contrast. My final tip is simply to take lots of pictures. Practice makes you better and taking more shots gives you more chances that the bird in the picture has its eyes open, the picture is in sharp focus, the wind has moved the leaves out of the way, and maybe you'll catch the bird with its beak open as it sings. My personal record was a day at Smith Oak Sanctuary on High Island during fallout after a cold front during spring migration. Just like the movie, The Big Year, it was like a buffet. I took 1,000 photos in a single day. On that one trip last spring, in 20 days, I took 9,000 photographs and we saw 190 species, including 26 warblers and 43 species that we had never seen before. With all that practice, then you'll be ready when the Rufus hummingbirds show up in Los Alamos in July. That's the beginning of the fall migration. When the Rufuses show up here, they are already headed back to Mexico for the winter after building their nests in the Pacific Northwest in April. And you'll be ready when a rare bird like this grasshopper sparrow shows up in White Rock. Bob Walker and I both photographed this rare bird at the same time. We were crouched side by side in the grass along the left field line at the softball field in Overlook Park. And you'll be ready when your friend calls to say that she's found a northern pygmy owl on a branch at the bottom of Pueblo Canyon. If you're logged on, Robin, thank you very much. And you'll be ready to save the memory of the first time you see your first scarlet tanager. So folks, please follow me on Instagram and see all my pictures at Snowy Egret Photography. And when you're at Bosque del Apache, swing by the Chupadero Gallery in San Antonio, New Mexico. Please, are there any questions? We can also take some questions at the end. So if you still want to think on it, feel free, no pressure. Nope. Awesome. So thank you, thank you Jonathan. Bob, are, are you ready? I am ready. Let's do this. All right, let's see if I can get started. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us this evening. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be able to talk to you. I spend a lot of time out there walking around and chasing some birds. And uh, when I'm just a little bit on the lucky side, I occasionally get a, a nice picture. Uh, Jonathan talked about all the pictures that he has taken. And uh, uh, I think the bad news I have for you, Jonathan, is that's not all that unusual. If you go out there, it takes a lot of photographs before you get something where all, all of the factors work in your favor to get a good picture. But you can be lucky. And so part of my talk is basically trying to get across the idea that if you uh, do the right things when you're out walking around, you can maximize the chance that you'll be lucky and, and come up with a nice photo. Good for me. All right. So here we are. Uh, that's the first slide. A few principles in general is if you're going to go out, uh, you're, you're, you're 
tool for taking the pictures. As Jonathan said, it's your camera. And probably that's not the time while you're walking around out there to figure out what each of those little buttons on your camera does. You, you want to know a lot about your camera before you go out. Uh, and and then you can use it sort of intuitively as a tool to capture pictures of the birds. Uh, I'll probably repeat a few of the ideas that Jonathan said about how to find birds. Uh, I find that when I'm out there taking pictures of birds, Jonathan's pictures are all wall hanging type pictures, and that's really awesome. Uh, I use my camera. Well, I, yeah, for a variety of reasons. And so uh, my bird pictures generally fall into several categories. I'll talk about that a little bit. And then at the end, I'll go over a few things that uh, are choices, because maybe you are taking 10,000 pictures or 1,000 pictures, but you'd like to down select from the 1,000 pictures to a handful that you think are really the best pictures. And uh, I'll talk then about what makes a nice bird photograph. OK, the best camera. It is really nice to have good equipment, but the best camera you can use is the one that's in your pocket or hanging around your neck. So um, given that you are going to be using the camera that you have with you, some cameras are going to be better at taking pictures of big, fat, slow birds sitting on a perch in the bright sunlight. Uh, and other cameras, if you're really after small, fast birds that are inside dark bushes, um, to get a good picture of those, it's going to be a little tougher and you may need fancier equipment to do it. So whatever you have, Set your sights on taking pictures of the birds that that camera is going to be able to take good, good pictures of. So most birds are tiny. The reason we're using large telescopic lenses is because the sensor on your camera is full of little tiny pixels and you want to lay as many of those pixels on top of the bird as you can. That'll give you better resolution because Jonathan didn't say it, but my first step on uh, post-processing all of my pictures is to chop off the parts of the picture that are, you know, to crop the photograph. Uh, chop off the parts of the picture that don't contribute to the appreciation of the bird. So the reason we use telescopic lenses is we want to uh, make, pretend like we're as close to the bird as we can possibly be. Okay, the next one. Here's a, an example of that idea. Uh, on the left uh, is a picture of a great blue heron. I was in Arizona visiting my daughter and went out to their version of the water treatment plant and took pictures of this great blue heron sit, standing on the walkway next to one of the uh, water retention ponds. Uh, so there's, there's a, a bird that's actually pretty easy and, and you can buy gadgets that you can even hang on to your cell phone that are sort of telescope, uh, telescopic lens adapters. Uh, and you could get a picture, a fine, perfectly fine picture of a bird like this if you are in full daylight and, uh, and the bird isn't moving very fast. Tougher are the little tiny birds. And uh, so I got the, the picture on the right is a picture of a couple little bush tits that are snuggling up to each other. They, they huddle together uh, when it gets cold at night and they huddle, huddle together to stay warm. Uh, and that's what these two little bush tits were doing. They're both females because they have those white uh, irises uh, around uh, their eye. Uh, but they're, they're probably also fairly young ones. There were several other bush, you hardly ever see one or two bush tips anyway. And there were several in this bush, but these two were cute uh, because they were huddled together, but it was dark. Uh, when you look at these pictures, they're both cropped from the original. And the next slide, 
uh, will give you an idea of what damage I did to the original picture uh, that I took uh, of these birds. So the first picture of the great blue heron, uh, that little tiny lightened up square uh, is the portion of the camera sensor that I used to take that picture. And so the first thing I did on my computer at home was to chop off uh, all the buildings in the background. Uh, on the bush tips, I chopped off all these trees and twigs and branches uh, because I'm after trying to maximize the cuteness factor of seeing those bush tips huddled together. So in the next one, uh, I, I was going to reiterate some of the things that Jonathan talked about, about how you go out and find the birds. Uh, I have two approaches to this. The first one is the lazy boys approach, and that is I throw bird food out in my yard. Uh, I have a pond in the backyard and some bushes, and I try to get the birds to come to me. That way I can put up one, my little version of, of that uh, blind, little putt tent. And I can take a chair out there and sit with my tripod and sit down and take pictures all day long. Uh, for the more adventurous, you, you go out and you find birds in the field. And so I'll go over some of the same things that Jonathan said there. So here's some pictures uh, on the next uh, slide of my backyard. And in the corner of my backyard next to that pear tree that's dropping a lot of very overripe pears at the moment, I've got a little tiny pond. And just the noise, just very much like the pond that's uh, visible from the wildlife observation area at the Nature Center, uh, it's got a waterfall. And so it makes lots of water, running water noises. And that's very attractive aside from the fact that birds need and like water in a dry climate like ours, just the sound of hearing the water moving is very attractive for bringing birds in to your yard. So uh, you'll find uh, if you look through all of uh, the pictures that I have taken, you'll see there's quite a large number of them of uh, birds sitting on the waterfall. And then the other thing I do is I put food out. And so I've got a little uh, on the right hand side of, of this slide, I've got a, uh, a little basket that's got some sunflower seeds in it and uh, sitting on top of a pole. The basket is intentionally too small for a bird. And so what they have to do is before they come and land in the basket to eat sunflower seeds, they land on this stick that I lashed onto a tripod with a couple of zip ties. And I'm sitting over in my pup tent, looking at the stick that they're gonna perch on. And you'll see, I get lots of pictures uh, from, from a very simple setup like that. Uh, so here's an example on the next slide uh, of an American Robin standing on the top of my waterfall. Uh, that was taken right there in my backyard, uh, oh, probably 10 years ago now. Um, and then uh, on a twig, well, the twig is interchangeable. I can go off and snip off any old branch, particularly in the spring when they're blooming. And so I cut off a branch of uh, my redbud tree and lashed it to the tripod and this fully uh, molted uh, American goldfinch hopped on there and um, I obliged him or he obliged me and, and we agreed to take his picture. Now, if you're not gonna bring the birds to yourself, uh, you can go out uh, in COVID land and uh, take, uh, take yourself and your camera to the many miles of Nature trails in Los Alamos. Uh, you can go all over the world, of course, uh, and and do that. But Los Alamos has a fantastic system of trails. You can go to the 
county website and download brochures of each of the um, most popular trails. And I think we have the, at the Nature Center, we have um, those brochures in a rack at the Nature Center as well. And I also make good use of eBird. In fact, I chopped off the same little uh, picture here that uh, Jonathan showed, and that is just the top 10 or 11 hot spots in Los Alamos. Shows the water treatment plant. There's a little pond behind Smith's up in Los Alamos uh, that's off of 6th Street. And when there's enough runoff from the parking areas there at that shopping center, um, that pond fills up with water. And if the water hangs around maybe for a couple of weeks, sometimes as long as a month, if that was back in, especially in the days when we used to get rain here in Los Alamos. And that Sixth Street Pond was very productive uh, because it was close to a canyon, uh, had lots of water, and I, 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 one of the highlights I remember is just a year ago, we had probably flocks of dozens of lazuli buntings that were feeding on seeds of grass that were growing up out of the pond. So the Sixth Street Pond is great. There's another area we call the confluence, uh, confluence of Pueblo and Acid Canyons. Acid Canyon is the canyon that runs right behind the nature center. And uh, if you follow the ranch school trail from the trailhead at, at the aquatic center uh, trailhead and, and go down where Acid Canyon joins up with Pueblo Canyon, that is by far the most productive area in the springtime when warblers are coming through. The, the whole bottom of that canyon is laced with willow trees and or willow bushes and the warblers just really like it. Bush tits gather cotton and hummingbirds are gathering nesting material down there. It's, it's an absolutely fantastic place for finding birds in Los Alamos County. The other two favorite places I have are the very green canyons we have, both the upper Los Alamos Canyon, the road that goes up to the reservoir, and upper water canyon, which is the um, uh, last sort of dip in the road as you drive uh, around through the back of the lab heading up to the back gate before the road uh, divides and either goes off the bandolier um, to the east and up to the Haynes Mountains um, to, the, to the west. Bandolier has a lot. There are trails down to there. We're very, very actually privileged to live in a place like Los Alamos, <clears throat> where we can sample elevations all the way from the Rio Grande River, all the way up to the ski trails up uh, on Pajarito Mountain. The uh, variety of birds you see in a lot of ways depends on the elevation that you're looking for them. We see lots of riparian species down by the river. You see a lot of montane species up uh, on the ski hill. And so if you need a fix for a particular kind of bird, you can often satisfy it by just deciding at what elevation you want to go birding on a particular day. So go out and find the birds. Here's an example uh, at the confluence. Uh, I have a picture that I wanted to show you of this cute little white-breasted nuthatch. They're very common. Uh, I like photographs, and we'll come back to this later. I like photographs that show enough of the bird in its natural surroundings uh, that are typical for that bird. White breasted nuthatches live in cavities on trees, and uh, uh, that's where we found this fellow. Uh, down there at the water treatment plant uh, uh, in White Rock, is where we get this species, uh, the blue grosbeak, that's actually. Uh, more of a river species that, that comes up to the water treatment plant, but they're just an absolutely gorgeous bird and they, they like to sing in the spring, set up on the tops of the trees, and they especially like having their photographs taken. Okay, so 
why do you take the photographs? Well, uh, most of the photographs that I take are taken so that I can figure out what the heck the bird is that I saw over there uh, two, three football fields away from me. Uh, so it helps me identify the bird. Sometimes I go home and it's just like magic. You know, I put the bird picture up on my computer and I discover I saw something I never even had a clue that that's what I was looking for when I was out there uh, hiking the trail. Um, when I'm going on trips out of town, I generally take these pictures because it, it provides me with good memories. And occasionally, if I get a decent picture, I like to share them with other people and, uh, and hope that, that they enjoy those pictures as well. So <clears throat> here's an example. We just had a walk. We uh, took a group of folks uh, from uh, Los Alamos and from the Valley and from Santa Fe uh, over to the Los Luceros historic site. And as soon as we walked out there, there's this snaggy tree way off in the distance and a group of four little birds fly into this tree. And we, the first question we ask is, well, well what are those? So wonderfully on the back of your camera, you can take the picture, you can blow it up and you can discover uh, what it is you're looking at. And uh, so after enlarging this little tiny area of the photograph on the left, we can get enough, if ugly as a, as a photograph, uh, but it's good enough to tell you that you're seeing a flicker on the one hand or an American robin on the other. So we use the photographs to identify the birds. A lot of my photographs, uh, and, and this sort of falls into the class of the photographs I use when I submit reports to eBird. You know, eBird is a citizen science project and you go out there and you hike a trail and you send in a list of what you saw. And if you, um, if you want, you can embellish that list with pictures of the birds you took. And none of these pictures are, are, are pictures that I'm showing now are going to be things that are ever going to show up on hanging on anyone's wall, but it makes it pretty clear uh, when I see a Wilson's warbler, that cute little yellow bird with a black hat, um, or see yellow-headed blackbirds, uh, which and these were pictures taken in the last couple of weeks. So uh, it helps you identify the birds, but also I can enter these photographs onto my eBird reports and uh, everybody else can get sort of an idea of what, what the birds are looking like right now. Yellow-headed blackbirds in the spring, uh, when they're in breeding plumage are just absolutely gorgeous. Well, they're always gorgeous, of course, but they're, they're really gorgeous in the spring and with their bright yellow heads, I'm thinking of the males, black bodies with white wing patches. So in the fall, like a lot of other birds, they molt into non-breeding plumage and they're not usually quite as spiffy looking. And then very occasionally I get out there and I take a picture and I think, hey, this is really cool and it'll make a great picture either hanging on the wall or as a backdrop on my computer screen. And so uh, over there at the Sixth Street Pond, uh, where I spent an awful lot of time uh, in the past few years, uh, there was this uh, yellow rump warbler uh, of the Audubon variety. They have yellow throats uh, that perched himself on one of the uh, Russian olive weeds that grow around the pond. But with the pond surface behind it, uh, and, and it's white around the bird because that's a reflection of a blurry cloud in the sky, uh, it makes for a very softly lit photograph that I decided I liked that a whole lot. And then uh, went to Arizona for a bird workshop and uh, the, the fellow who ran this bird workshop put a, little cute, a lot of cute flowers around the tree stump and enticed this roadrunner to hop up on the tree stump and we burned a, a lot of electrons uh, uh, to try to capture that. And so that's also one of my favorite uh, desktop monitor backgrounds. So what, 
what do you have to do? What, what makes you decide one picture is a better picture of a bird than another? Um, Jonathan's talked about a lot of things that are pretty obvious. You want to get the shutter speed, aperture, and ISO, and focus all as technically correct as possible. And so when I'm sorting through the thousand pictures I take in a day and I throw 900 of them away, it's because one of those things probably wasn't set right, uh, focus especially. The best pictures are the ones where there's as few distracting elements in the picture as possible. And generally that means a clean background. Um, when you shoot at uh, as low an aperture as possible, uh, low apertures correspond to the camera lens um, diaphragm being open as big as possible. So it's an inverse relationship, but uh, it means that the depth of field is going to be very small and that helps allow you to make the bird be in focus and the background is all blurred out so that your attention is completely directed on the bird. There are a lot of other sort of standard composition kinds of things that, uh, that go along with any kind of photography, things like the rule of thirds or the use of leading lines. Um, a lot of people like to think of a photograph as being balanced uh, in, a, in almost a mass weighted sense. Uh, so that, uh, well, I'll show you a picture of, of what I mean by that. And, and even use of negative space. I'll give you an example of that one as well. Uh, for things that have specific application to birds, you do want it focused. And if you can get the bird close enough to you where, where you've got, generally, uh, birds like to turn their back end towards me uh, because they're getting ready to escape. And so what I wait for is for them to crank their head around and look back and, and I'm going to have the tail of the bird out of focus, but if I can get the focus on the bird's eye, in fact, everything is about the eye. That's, that's what the real objective is. It's also best if you're about at the same level as the eye of the bird. You know, it, it, it's not all that interesting to look at a picture of a bird on a branch straight above your head. You may be two inches from it but you're going to get a belly shot and it's not going to look normal. You want to establish eye contact with the bird. You want to have him look like he's comfortable in your presence. So I also like including these environmental elements. And that's what I meant when, for example, the I've got a lot of pictures of white-breasted nuthatches sitting on fence posts or something like that, things that are made by people but it's much nicer to have them climbing on the side of a tree because that's what they do. The top and most important or interesting thing that makes a good picture is if you can do, show something in the photograph that indicates the behavior of the bird or includes uh, elements of action. So here's an example. I've got two pictures of a bush tit. I'm very fond of bush tits. You'll see that. Uh, I guess even female bush tits because that's what both of these are. And so uh, over at the White Rock Water Treatment Plant was a bush tit hopping around in this uh, three-leaf sumac uh, bush. That's what the red berries are. Skunk bush, a lot of people call them. Um, and so that's one picture. Uh, another picture is a female bush tit that was on a forsythia twig uh, like first of January or something uh, right in my front yard. And both these pictures have good things about them and, and bad things about them. The first picture, the bird may be a little too tiny. There's a lot of leaves there and that can be a little distracting. If I was gonna, if I have enough pixels on the bird, enough resolution, I might crop that if I was gonna try to make a better picture and crop it to where the bird's tail is at one end of the photograph, the tip of the tail and I'd include those pretty nice red berries and, and tighten up uh, the whole picture. And I think that would make it look a little better. The bush tip that's on the twig in the front yard, well, it's great, right? I've got a, uh, the bird pretty much all in focus, at least his eyes in focus, the tail's, tail's sticking far enough away that he's outside the depth of field of the photograph. Um, 
But in this one, uh, so I've got a relatively clean background, except it's pretty obvious that there's other twigs behind the bird, and that's a little distracting. So neither of them is going to ever show up on my wall, uh, but it illustrates some of the points about uh, what I look for in trying to decide what's a good bird to photograph. Um, Here's an example. Uh, I, I think I also sort of like birds where the bird is facing one way and looking around the other. Um, and so that's what I did here on this western bluebird when I selected that picture. Uh, it's nice. You can see his eye. You can see a catch light of the sun shining in his eye. And it, it looks like he's comfortable in my presence. In the springtime, uh, Western tanagers are probably the most striking and beautiful birds that we see here, and that's one sitting on the fence rail um, there uh, from the observation room at the nature center. So once again, we see their eyes, the tanager uh, and the Western bluebird, the whole bird is pretty much nicely in focus all the way from the head to the tail. So that's what I liked about those. Now here's a couple of pictures that it were taken just a few seconds apart of a black phoebe. Uh, it, it's either a molting one or a very young one. I'm not sure I'm smart enough to know. Um, but it's at the water treatment plant there in, in White Rock. And so there's some things that are good and bad about both of these. I really like in the picture on the right hand side, the fact that the birds got his wings raised. I think he was preening or something like that. Um, that's a, I, I find that interesting. Um, the bird on the left, the, the bird on the right, you can't see a highlight in his eye. It's dark. Uh, and so he sort of looks a little, you know, zombie-ish in some sense. The bird on the, on the left has a nice catch light in his eye. It's obvious that he's turned his head there because he's trying to figure out who I am and what am I doing there. Uh, a negative part about both these, oh, they're sitting on that uh, nice rusty barbed wire and that's not nature, but that's where they were. And it's, you know, the photography of birds is an exercise in opportunistic photography, photography. Okay, yes, Jonathan promised we would look at these pictures of the grasshopper sparrow uh, and Indeed, we did. We, we heard from somebody that he was hopping around East State for three or four days. He let people get within 15 feet of him, um, even to the point we weren't sure if he was uh, all right in the head. Um, but here's two different pictures of it. Why do I like one more than the other? Well, uh, the top picture is I'm maybe standing up, maybe I'm on my knees. Uh, and I'm looking down and the background is all these grasses and weeds uh, there on the baseball field. And so old and fat as I am, I had to get a better picture of it. And so I plopped myself down right on my belly and got as low as I could to try to get down to the bird's eye level. So um, I like the picture on the right better. Uh, behind the head of the bird and the eye, which is where I'm always gonna look first, uh, the background is uh, not as distracting as it is in the first picture with all the orange weeds. So that's an example. Um, here's a pair. Which of these two pictures do you like better? The mountain bluebird, well, he's, he's certainly the center of attention of the picture. It's the, he's the only thing in the picture against the featureless blue sky. And he's got his butt pointed towards me and he's looking away. That bird doesn't look quite as comfortable in my presence as the one on the right, which is calmly sitting in a nice juniper bush, curious about what the heck am I doing uh, hanging around him. So clearly uh, I'm gonna select the bird on the right uh, over the picture of the bird on the left, even though same bird, same, same place. We were very fortunate to have a rare bird come visit us. Uh, maybe it was last year even, but uh, it's called a red-eyed vireo. It's a much more common bird for uh, the folks on the eastern side of the country. And we had all that weird weather last year. 
And so a lot of birds started uh, passing through uh, the front range of the Rockies that we don't normally see in the red-eyed vireo, I think is one of them. Um, both pictures have some nice things about them. Uh, the, the one on the left, he was at the water treatment plant. He was hanging around in those bushes. I think he was finding insects on the leaves and things like that and having a great time. Uh, the one on the right was over uh, near uh, the Sullivan's house on Portrillo in Powerito Acres and uh, caused quite a stir. Uh, the, they had uh, a nice group of people descend upon their front yard and look for this bird. Uh, I think it was last fall. Uh, I like the picture on the right. It does have uh, enough elements of, of, of natural environment in the picture, but I don't think it's so much as to be terribly distracting. Plus, I have a better look at the eye of the bird on the right-hand side. Then action. Well, uh, I picked a couple of shots because I uh, roamed the earth sometimes uh, just for the fun of it and went down to Pantanal, which is a large area in Brazil. Uh, we saw this uh, Toco Tucan. And uh, of course there, if you live there, they're just like we would have house finches or something, they're common. Uh, and they put out dog food for them to eat. And this Toco Tucan was sitting on a branch of a tree, he'd pick up a little bite of dog food and toss it in the air and catch it. And so that little spot there is him uh, doing uh, food acrobatics. Uh, in another place, sort of near a nature reserve uh, there in the Pantanal, they have uh, uh, sort of a raptor a class of birds, uh, caracaras. Um, and uh, I really liked uh, the, in this picture of the Chamango Caracaras, the fact that they have a nice clean background, they're sitting on these barberry type bushes that are uh, common in the area, and the one that's coming in and landing night has his wings up in a nice uh, pose, and, and so that, that picture made it to my desktop background. And then there's real honest to goodness interactions of one bird with another. Uh, on the left uh, is a picture of a Baltimore Oriole. I was down in Galveston while Jonathan was wandering around on High Island. I was in Galveston and uh, taking pictures uh, sort of at, in a setup type situation like I had in my backyard. This, this perch with all that nice little moss on it uh, was strapped to a tripod somewhere and some fellow's house, uh, you're looking at the grass and weeds that grows in his backyard. And, um, but the Baltimore Oriole landed on that perch because there's an orange stuck on the tip end of it where outside the picture where you can't see it. And he wants to make sure when he's on that perch that nobody else gets in his way. So when the gray cat bird on the right starts uh, uh, flying in to land and, and compete with him for that orange, uh, the two of them get together and, and I find it interesting to see the interactions between one bird and another. More of the same, uh, in a trip to Africa, there's a class of birds called the carmine bee eaters. They live in sandbanks on the sides of rivers. They dig long, deep holes like gophers. Uh, and that's where they raise their young. And it gets hot there. It was 100 degrees the day I took that picture. And these bee eaters come and they fly sort of like our swallows do and, and skim the water. These guys actually do a full face plant into the water and uh, get themselves wet and cool off. And it was a lot of fun trying to get pictures um, of these bee eaters splashing in the water. And then I have another picture on the right hand side of uh, another couple of birds uh, trying to have a reasoned discussion of who owns the perch next to the orange. Rose breasted grosbeak and an orphan northern mockingbird. So, uh, resources. I thought I'd finish up. 
with this. There are a lot of resources for people to use if you uh, want to get out there and uh, either learn more about birds or learn more about photographing birds. Um, on my smartphone, when I'm walking out there, I carry a, basically two field guides. One is a field guide called iBird, um, and uh, it, it shows pictures of birds in the ranges uh, that they are normally found in, has recordings of what they sound like when they sing. Uh, Sibley is a Make, makes very well known field guides for birds and you can get a smartphone version of Sibley's uh, guide to North American birds uh, and put that right on your phone and whip it out of your pocket while you're out there in the field. However, um, it's really hard. You see a bird and you have no clue what it is. It, it takes a long time to thumb through the entire field guide. So, um, there is an app called Merlin, uh, and if you record the bird's song or, or a picture, you can feed it to Merlin, and it'll come back with suggestions as to what that bird was. Another one that does sound is one called bird.net. On the internet, on your computer, the eBird, all about birds, whatbird.com is the outfit that uh, uh, makes the iBird app, and, uh, and then the most academically detailed version of anything I've found uh, is a site called Birds of the World. You have to, it's a subscription site, but it has all sorts of primary literature references for behavior and, and everything you want to know about a bird. So if I really want to get in and try to understand as much as I can about what a bird does, Birds of the World is where I go. Okay, thank you. I think I'm done. Uh, here's a nice little Rufus hummingbird that seemed to me that he was bowing, and so I'll use that to close off. I'm awesome. done. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Does anyone have any questions from Bob or Jonathan? Some thank yous coming in. I did have one question. Why? why water treatment plants like why are they going to those specific areas uh in in our area it's largely because there's water there and mm. uh, the birds get thirsty but there's also quite a variety of habitat um they're very natural areas uh, in your backyard, you've got it, probably planted it up with a whole bunch of bushes that are only found in Minnesota or something like that, because you're trying to recreate your youth. Um, and, and everything that you find at the water treatment plant is growing there because it, it's natural or invasive, at least. Um, so there's that. It's close to the water. It's close to the river. And so a lot of the birds that you would normally only find at the river come up there. Um, the, the area that's most productive in Los Alamos, the confluence, uh, is just one of the wettest areas. And uh, the story I heard from Michael Smith, who's, who's one of our really expert birders, is that um, if you're a bird and you're flying a thousand feet up in the sky and you look down at Los Alamos and you say, where is the best place to land? You're gonna land in the confluence because it's green and it's thick. And, uh, so it's a, good, it's a good spot. The water treatments plants are good everywhere. You get lots of shorebirds. There are uh, treatment ponds even in Bandelier that are not terribly accessible but we do get a lot of shorebirds and uh, migrating waterfowl that come through. They're looking for a, a pond. Ashley Pond gets good stuff. Awesome, thank you. Bob, I've and been to three different uh, water treatment plants, uh, two in New Mexico and one in Arizona, that all had a feature in common. They have freshwater surface water discharge. They have a flowing stream at the outlet of the sewage treatment plant. 
And yeah. that's like you said, like the fountain in your backyard, that sound of the water helps to attract the birds. Awesome, very cool. Um, and a lot of thanks, thank yous coming in. So just to remind people, this program is recorded. Um, we will put it up in our on our YouTube in a couple of weeks. And um, if there's no other questions, which I'll check one more time. Nope, just a lot of thank yous. Good job, you two. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks for having us. Yeah, of course. So again, thank you to Jonathan, Bob, and of course, thank you to everybody who actually tuned in to listen to this program. It was great. I learned a lot about bird photography. And um, if you're interested in other peak programs, please visit our website and remember to fill out that evaluation that is coming your way um, tonight or tomorrow. And yeah, so thank you so much, everyone. And I hope you all have a good night. Just seeing the chat one more time. Just lots of thank yous. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Thank you both. Excellent job. Thank you. Good night. Night, everybody. Good night.